I pray that's your statement. Um, everything that's here is going to go away one day. But Jesus is here to yesterday, today, and forevermore. Hallelujah. Uh, Judy just shared with me, she just got a, uh, I don't know if it's Facebook, it was Facebook, but a dear friend of mine, and he's actually sat in this room. He came, drove all the way out here. He was headed to someplace out west, and they stopped in and visited with us. Uh, dear friends of ours, Frank and Teresa Shemkus. He's an old Vietnam uh, veteran. Uh, Sam, when I got here, he was always pushing me to go down to the VA. Well, Frank was the one that was always pushing me in Florida to go to the VA. Uh, he was a Marine, of course, Sam's Army, but uh, those, uh, say again, Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine. Well, let me tell you something. The only true Marine is a submarine, amen? <laughs> but anyway, Frank had a heart attack yesterday, and he's in the hospital. They had went up to go to the a grandson's graduation, who was supposed to graduate today. It doesn't look like they're going to make it, but... Uh, uh, he's in pretty bad shape, and he, they're gonna, he did have a heart attack. They've got him scheduled. They're going to try to go in and do heart cath tomorrow. So maybe they'll get him fixed. He's, he's had a heart attack or two before, and he's got some stents and all kinds of stuff, and it's amazing what them things will do. Uh, I heard Chip talking about it. I, I knew a missionary that had 28 stents in his heart. We called him the Energized Bunny, and he said, you don't have no arteries no more. It's all wire. But anyway, uh, y'all pray for Frank. He's a friend of mine. He's, he's hardcore, calloused, uh, but he loves the Lord. And uh, I can't say this about a whole lot of people, but he loved me, and he's always taking care of me. Two of the nicer suits that I wear, I think, I think it's one of that I've got on right now. Frank bought for me. So that is the uh, kind of friend he is. And, uh, but anyway, y'all pray for him. But I'm going to ask Cheryl if she'll come. Read our text. I'm going to tell you this morning has been a uh, has been one hurdle right after another. Um, it's a lot of things going on, and and I've prayed about this message today. I've prayed about the time too, and I, I want you to know that I'm trying to get you out before noon. But here's the thing: if God takes over and He starts leading me to say things, I can't help but say it. If I don't, if I don't say what He lays on my heart, He'll let me have a heart attack. I'm sure. Because when I stop doing what he tells me to do, then I'm in trouble. And I, and I pray that you'll be patient. I'm trying to get us through all this crazy stuff that we won't be here. If you know the Lord, you're not going to be here during all this. But I want to challenge us for what we can do today, knowing these things, uh, that somebody else might not have to go through this. Because it could happen. Can you think about this? If the Lord was to come back in the rapture today, the events that we're talking about today could happen within the next three years. It's, it's, it's a strong thought and a strong thing that we need to make sure we tell others, okay? So y'all pray with me. And like I said, there's a, there's, I be, this message is a, it's a salvation message in itself, but you're going to see some things that you just never would have thought would have taken place. Cheryl? Uh, morning. Pastor Al has been teaching about basically the destruction of the world. He's been talking about the death of millions of people. In Jeremiah, where I've been reading in my quiet time, they're talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and Judah. And they're talking about millions or thousands at least of people dying in wars. And I can only take so much of that. I don't know about you guys, but <laughs> I'll be glad when this is over too. <laughs> But, um, Andrew, uh, God is faithful, and I love that song about God's faithfulness. And there was a word, there was a word in, uh, that I read this morning, uh, and it says, uh, Ah, sword of the Lord, you cry, how long till you rest? Return to your scabbard, cease and be still. But how can it rest when the Lord has commanded it? So the Lord is also faithful in his discipline. Sometimes we only think about him being faithful in his love, but he's also faithful in his discipline. But Andy reminded me of an encouraging word that came earlier in the book. This is in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, 11 through 14, I believe. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord 
plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Praise God. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. So that is an encouragement. Now let me read the verses that Al gave me this morning. If you would like to stand, this is out of Revelation 9, 13 to 21. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. They wore breastplates, the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. And the heads of the horses were like lion's heads, and smoke, fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. The rest of mankind... This is the really sad part to me. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hand, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Let's pray. Father, this is serious stuff. It makes us want to cry when we hear these words. Lord, there's so much damage that Satan has done in our world. And yet you, Lord, have found a way to conquer it. Lord, it's, we just are so grateful for your son coming to conquer the grave and to give us joy and peace. We just want to thank you for that, Lord. And we pray that you'd especially help Al as he's digging deep into this difficult passage, these difficult events. We pray that you would lift him up with your grace, Amen. help him to speak encouragement, help him to make it understandable to us. And we just pray that you would lift us all up, even, even in the midst of all of this misery, Lord. We pray that we would tell others the truth about you so that they might not, so that they might escape this, Lord. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that prayer, Cheryl. Um, on the back of your bulletin is my notes. Uh, take some notes down today. I believe that today's verses, they're nothing. I've probably used all these verses a time or two since I've been your pastor, but I, I believe these are some verses that we can see. And, and as I've said time and time again, the challenge that I have as we go through the book of Revelation is to make sure that I challenge you to use what God has given us so that we can prepare not only ourselves, our families, and our loved ones, but the community that we live in. To tell them, you know, if we, we, we often say if the, you drove up into somebody's, your neighbor's driveway and their house was on fire, you would go and knock on the door and tell them their house was on fire. Well, we're going to see the world be on fire here, and we're going to continue this second, um, you know, the, the, the trumpet that's about to be blown, that has been blown here, uh, you know, we're in the second quarter, and these are the trumpets. And, 
And today, as we saw last week, that eagle that was flying over saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. Because the things that are about to happen are nothing that this world has seen. We think of spiritual attacks that we have spiritually, but this is a physical attack. We're seeing creatures that uh, have been prepared for this day. And I believe that if, if, if we don't study this and we don't understand what it is, the good thing is if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're part of the bride of Christ, and he's already called his bride home to heaven. Amen? We saw that in Revelation chapter 4. But I want us to see what's going to happen, and let's get into the message. My notes are on the back of the bulletin. Take some notes. Last week we heard the fifth trumpet, and we saw that there was this first attack. Uh, the bottomless pit has been opened by a special angel, and these locust-type creatures, and they're small, I think. I believe as I read this, John said they were a locust. He described them as a locust, so we have to go back to the locusts of John's day and they were like big grasshoppers and they eat all the vegetation and they destroyed crops and all this but these locusts didn't hurt the crops because the meteor had already taken the majority of that out anyway but their purpose was to sting men with their tails which had a scorpion sting that burned and in, but they couldn't die and we saw that and that was the first wave the first woe and today we're going to talk about the second woe begins. The second woe begins. Uh, if we go to our text in verses 13 and 14, it says, Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar. Let's just stop there for a second. This voice is Jesus, okay? When you deal with the altar in the Old Testament, it's a picture of what's to come with Jesus on the cross of Calvary. But in this situation, the altar is before God. This is an actual altar that's there in heaven. We have the Holy of Holies where God sits in the throne room and we've got all the implements that, that were in the Old Testament tabernacle there in heaven. Amen? So when we know that Jesus died and he is the... You remember when we were studying in, in chapters when he was talking about the church, the seven churches, we talked about uh, the slain lamb. This is what it is. And he says to this, this angel who blows the trumpet, he says, he says, saying to the sixth angel who had, had the trumpet, release the four angels. We're not given names. We're not given anything like we had last week. We just know that these four angels who have been bound at the great river Euphrates. Now we read of the river Euphrates. We can go to uh, Egypt and, and go over to that section of the world or that neighborhood and the river Euphrates is still there. You have the Tigris and the Euphrates. They come together. And why do you think it is that God would use this great river? Well, I'm going to show you. Um, I'm, I'm just so I don't spend too much time on it. I'm going to read what Tim Leahy said in his book, Revelation Unveiled. He said, these four evil angels are today bound in the area of the world is no accident. For it seems that some of the world's greatest events took place near the Euphrates River. Since it was a boundary for the Garden of Eden, I don't know if you remember that, go back to Genesis and study that, near this, uh, this river the first sin of humankind was committed. The first war was fought. The Tower of Babel erected in defense, defiance against God. It was near the river Euphrates that Nimrod built the city of Babylon. And we're going to see Babylon later in Revelation where idolatry received its origin and surged through the world. It was to, to Babylon that the children of Israel uh, were taken captive. And it will be in this area of the world that the final sin of man will culminate. Here, according to Revelation chapter 18, the city of Babylon will be rebuilt and come to the headquarters of the commercial, religious, military activities of the world until the Antichrist rule. The river Euphrates is a very, very important landmark, and we see that these angels, they've been held there. I believe it's only fitting that the Garden of Eden, you remember when Adam and Eve were cast out, there was a, an angel placed there, a cherubim that was placed there with a fiery sword. 
I believe that this angel is also keeping guard on these four angels. I believe because of the sin and the things that would transpire in this little neck of the woods, it's going to be a bad time. And it's there today, and that's where it's going to come from. This is going to be a terrible event. Um, and, you know, and it, it answers the, the, the warnings that we have read about all through Scripture. God has said, I will judge. I will pour out my wrath. I will keep my promise. Praise the Lord, he's going to keep his promise. And we think about it going to heaven. We know that if we die and we have Jesus, he promised us that he would take us to heaven. Amen. We keep that promise, right? We look forward to that promise. And we also have to understand that he has promised the world that if you do not accept my son, this is God talking, if you reject Jesus, my only begotten son, then you will be judged and this wrath will happen. That's not a fairy tale. It's not something that's pleasant to look at. And I hear it so many times. People say, but, but God's love. You go to 1 John, you read the whole chapter or a whole book of 1 John. It's all about God and His love and how He is love. But if He loves us so much, He's going to keep His word. Would you not agree with that? And this is a hard time to... Um, I, I mean, it's, it's, I hate spending a lot of time on this because there's so many other things I would rather spend my time studying Scripture. But I said we'd preach the book of Revelation and we're going to go verse to verse. So we see these four angels and we see this. And this is not a second wave of, you know, last week we said it was the first wave of the demonic army that devil is going to bring onto earth and God's going to allow to do things. Last week we said kind of hoping that, that we would understand that maybe it's the last chance of last chances. He's given us chance after chance after chance. But this is not a figuratively uh, wave of attack. It's not a spiritual wave of attack. It's a physical wave of attack. Those that are left here will see these creatures. A lot of people want to say and uh, try to point to China and the armies of China and all this. I believe they are creatures from hell. And I might, you know, lead us to ask a question, and that's what I want us to consider today. As we think about this terrible event, what a, how many chances has God given? Seriously, how many times has God given us chance after chance after chance? Is there an appointed time? You see, that's part of what Scripture says. It says, you know, uh, well, where is Jesus? He said he would return for you. He says, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am there you may be also. Amen. And if I prepare this place, I'm going to come and get you and take you there. And I believe we need to hold true to that. But how many times, and we see the world, they just turn their back on Jesus. Oh, yeah, I've heard the story of Jesus. I've, uh, how many of y'all know Raul here in the town? Homeless guy, Raul. I've been dealing with Raul. He's probably, um, I've been talking to him since the first week I was here. He was the first time I checked into my office. Lisette and them goes out there. And that afternoon, Raul showed up on my doorstep. And I've been talking to Raul, but he's learned to come to me. And he says, I've got God in my heart. He's learned the words that he needs to kind of keep me from talking about Jesus. But then he says, you know I have a mental problem. I said, that's the reason I keep telling you the same thing. You need Jesus. And I've invited him to church. I hope if he shows up one day, somebody will say, come sit with me, Raul. But here's the thing. The world has turned their back on God. They said it's been 2,000 years. In the grand scheme of things, you know, I know the scientists say 6 million or billion years and all this. I'm of a firm belief that this earth is only about 6,000, probably pushing 6,000 years or 7,000 years old. That being said, how many times in that 7,000 years has God given us chance after chance after chance? I believe point one, if you'll turn there, point one, there is an appointed time. Verses 15 and 16 say, so the, th so the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops were twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. 
John didn't. It wasn't. I can't count them because he would have not been able to say one, two, three. Somebody told him in that great crowd. And I believe that if anybody was to face, and that number, if you want to try to do all the math and everything, I did it for you. He has 200 million soldiers. If that was China, they need to grow some. You know, that's the thing. I, I started doing the math, and I said China's army today is only about 2 million. Uh, this is 200 million. So we need to understand that these are not a, 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 a human force that we're going to see come to, to fruition here. This is creatures that were prepared that with these four angels for this day and this time. They're held in the bottomless pit. We'll see that here in a little bit. But their time has come. We have a timeline for everything. We're told that in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 8. I'm going to read the very first. It says, For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under the heavens. You go on, it says there's a time for growing and, and planting and harvesting and living and dying. And it goes on. But go back and read it. But there is a time for everything. And I believe that as God has said, I will show you the time and the place. And this is a place that God has, is going to pour out His wrath. But there is a time to repent. And I believe that's what our job today is, to show people that they can repent. And they can ask Jesus to forgive them of their sins. And they can turn their heads from the world of self and Satan and the things of this world and turn them to Jesus and call Him Lord. In Acts chapter 3, we read, Repent. Therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. John, when the Lord looks at us, he doesn't see our sins, does he? He sees a robe of righteousness that Jesus gave us there on the cross of Calvary. If we accept what he did on the cross, he forgives our sins, he blots them out, but then what he does, he gives us his robe of righteousness that we receive his divine righteousness. And I believe that's what God sees and he sees us. And the verse goes on to say, out of the times and refresh may come from the presence of the Lord. We can see Jesus then. We can talk to Jesus. And that he may send the Christ appointed, uh, sent the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom have must, heaven must have received until the time for restoring all the things that are uh, about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. The Old Testament was to point to the cross of Calvary and what God was doing. He was going to send a seed through the, uh, the family of Abraham, the Israelites. And he's going to send a seed that would be the Lamb of God. And we know John Baptist says that. And he, he's nailed to the cross to take care of our sins, to wash our sins away. He took our wrath. This word wrath is very important that we understand that God is a just God. And if he promised us that he was going to pour out his wrath, you better be ready for it. But we need to repent. And if we do that, we will be saved from that wrath. So there is a time to be counted. Are you in the numbers that have repented, have turned from the ways of the world and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Ephesians chapter 5 says, Look carefully then how you walk not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are, e are evil. You don't have to look very far to see evil in our world. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand that the will of the Lord is what the will of the Lord is. What is it that the Lord wants you to do? Why did God send Jesus to die on the cross? To be a martyr? No. He sent Jesus to die on the cross his only beloved son, only begotten son, the only one that could ever do what he, God needed to be done. So what? So that if we would believe, he would give us everlasting life. Yes. Not the death, not the wrath, but everlasting life. Are you aware of this appointed time? Do you remember a day in your life that you accepted Jesus as your Lord? Do you know the time... I mean, you know, I don't, I don't expect you to have a date. If it wasn't for the Internet, I couldn't tell you the day I got saved. I just knew it was a special event and I could go back. I was in the third grade. But I remember a time as a young boy of eight years old, I come down and I come to an altar and made it public that I had accepted Jesus as my Lord. 
Did I always do what he said? No. But I do know I'm saved. I do know that he died for me. I do remember the day that I said yes. Can you do that? I don't need to know the date. But if you cannot remember an event in your life where you turned your eyes off of yourself and the world, you can't remember that. There needs to be a change to that. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'd rather come down an aisle a second time and somebody think something about me because I think that's what happens, especially in a church of our age. People are afraid to come down the aisle. People are afraid to come to this old-fashioned altar. And I call it old-fashioned because there's people in the world today that say we don't need the altar anymore. It's a life-changing event that happens down here on this altar. It actually starts in your chair, in your heart. Do you have and understand that appointed time, how important it is to your future? Hebrews chapter 9 says this. Verse, start with verse 27. And, and just as it is appointed unto men to once die, and after that becomes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Jesus, you remember they came to him there under the altar. And he says, when will you avenge me? And that's what Jesus is about to do. He is the one that told the angel that blew the sixth trumpet, go let him go. It's time. Point number two, there is an appointed weapon. There's an appointed weapon. We're talking about a warfare that's going on and we need to understand that they have a weapon. I want you to also, as we read this, think about the weapons that we might have to our disposal today. Verse 17 says, and this is the how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. John's trying the best he can to describe them. They wore breastplates the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. And the heads of the horses were like lions' heads and the fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. Can you imagine how hideous this creature looks? A horse, I've always liked riding horses. But this one's breathing fire. You know, fire-breathing dragons, these are fire-breathing horses. And this is how they do it. They blow this smoke and this sulfur, but it's about fire. And these colors that we're talking about, I believe it's more than just the color, but it has a burning. Have you ever struck a match and the head stick to your finger? It sticks. That's sulfur. And the reason it sticks is it, it's so hot that it burns and melts your skin into that. Now that's what this weapon is that this horse has. And we're going to see it in the lake of fire too that it burns with fire and brimstone. These are obviously not human beings. They are not actual horses. They are like horses, but they are demonic and they have been released with the evil spirits from the bottomless pit or the abyss, if you will. Uh, and it's, it's about... You know, along with these creatures, these locusts that we saw last week, now we have these horses coming out. The locusts couldn't kill you. you could only, it could only cause you to hurt. And you would ask for death, but it wouldn't come. These are going to kill people. These are going to bring death that Satan will be using as a weapon. There is a weapon that, use, that Satan loves to use today. And I believe if... If you're honest with yourself, you would agree with me that Satan's biggest powerful weapon that he has is that he's a liar. He doesn't tell the truth. He says he takes what God says, he mingles it with a little bit, and then he calls it his truth, and that is called heresy. And men so readily listen to it. John chapter 8 says this, verse 44, You are of your father the devil... And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, the truth of God that is. Because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. But he is a liar and the father of lies. He loves to tell a lie and he wants to tell you a lie that God's never going to destroy this earth. 
There are people who say, I'll just wait until I've lived out my, sowed my oats, if you will. It's only by the grace of God that we're allowed to do that and still be here today. I believe it's important that we understand that Satan will lie to you every chance he gets. Oh, you've got another day. You've got another, uh, another time that you can accept Jesus. Go on about your life. Have some fun. Or he'll give you something even bigger like what he did with Eve there in the Garden of Eden. Go back and read Genesis chapter 3. But there is a weapon that Satan hates. If he's the father of lies, why would it not be that Satan hates the truth? Amen. Every time you see Satan on the scene and, and Jesus comes on the scene, or, and, and how does he defeat him? With the truth, with the scripture. Amen. In the, in the, there in the wilderness, he quoted scripture, and that's what made the Satan finally just say enough's enough for a little bit. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and to the spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intents of the heart. You want to fight against Satan, you break out the word of God. You break out the truth, and you see if he doesn't run. Yeah, you may have a battle. You may feel the hit. You may feel something come up against you. But I'm going to tell you something. If you break out the word of God and you start speaking the truth to him, he has no other choice but to tuck tail and run. Try it sometimes and see if it don't work. Why do we pray? If you can't pray and read God's word, why do you expect God to answer you? Who brings, the who brings the troubles to you? Who brings the battle to you? It's Satan. He's lied to you. This world's so eat up with lies and don't know the, which way's up or down. It's because God's children, us, me and you, we're trying to have a tent revival September the 18th. I'm looking forward to it. But I think we need to be working this week to have a revival in our homes and in our hearts and in, a, in this community that we have. Let me show you a little truth. I called the, the mayor. I sent it. I called his receptionist. And she says, I'll put a word in that he'll call you back. And I sent him an email as well. And I wanted to include it. And I, just, I said, well, I, need to, I need the governor to be, or the governor. Yeah, I wish I could get the governor on board. Uh, I want to see the mayor involved with this revival. He called me last Monday. Hallelujah. I didn't think I'd get the call, really. I thought I'd get an email and said, Okay. But he says, I'm going to tell you what. We talked for 40, 45 minutes. He says, I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to talk to my team and see if there's anything legally you have to do. But even more so, maybe we can help out. I never expected that part of it. I just wanted to make sure he was okay with it. But he wants to help out. So you be praying that he keeps his word. You be praying that he'll step up. His team will be on board. I'm hoping they've got some Porta Johns stacked somewhere in, in the city of Bernalillo that we can borrow because them things are about $130 a piece. And we've got to rent a few of them. You see, the devil wants to tell us lies and he wants to say that people, well, the mayor, he, he's not going to be involved with that. We kept praying and we've done it and he is going to be involved. I believe he is. Amen. Satan hates the truth. And there's a weapon for you, and I've just told you. You have the Word of God. You talk to God. You pray to God. 1 John 5, verse 4 says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. Who's in the world? Satan. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. It's one thing to have the Word of God. It's one thing to pray God to God. But do you have faith that He is who He says He is? you got to believe the Word. you got to believe when you wield the Word of God, it will cut to the soul and that God will get the glory from it. Amen? Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Amen. Are you aware of the appointed weapon that you have? For though we walk in flesh, we are not waging war again according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to what? Destroy strongholds. Smallest, youngest, 
oldest, doesn't matter. Little Miss Virginia back there, I remember her telling a testimony how she talked to somebody about Jesus at her little uh, uh, senior exercise group. What are we doing? Chip, give me a song to read the words to. And the second verse of the verse says, when was the last time I brought somebody to Jesus? Let us be a about that appointed weapon. Let us speak the truth. Let us destroy these strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. There is coming a day. There's an appointed time. There's an appointed weapon. But then we see there is an appointed means. An appointed means. Everything that God has created has a purpose and a means. And starting with verse 18 of our text, it says, But these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by fire, smoke, and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses in their, is in their mouths and in their tails. We didn't mention the snakes a while ago. Their tails are like serpents with heads, and by, the, by this means of them they wound. I believe the tails wound much like the scorpions or the, uh, the locusts. But I believe that the fire is what is going to destroy and kill people. As we saw the fourth horseman, we saw 25%, a quarter of the population that we read about in Revelation 6 verse 8. And as a result, the, a quarter of the population, and, and, and based on today's numbers, 7.8 billion people, that fourth horse will see 1.95 billion. Almost 2 billion people die. Now we've got this sixth trumpet and these horses and it says a third of the population will be destroyed, will die. Again, that's real close to two billion people that will die. Now I want you to get this in your heads and think about it. And a lot of people, they, when they, I believe, and we've been doing a timeline. I've been trying to show you. We are coming up on halfway of the tribulation. Three and a half years. Three and a half years, especially in our age group, that goes by pretty quick, don't it? I'm in my eighth year as your pastor. I, it just seems like it was yesterday I came. Three and a half years, and now we have seen half the population destroyed in three and a half years. Not of America, but the world. Let that settle in for just a minute. We're not just talking about a battle we're talking about World War to, that makes WW1 and 2 seem like nothing. Everybody will be in this war. And we're going to see death and destruction. And these creatures and what they're going to do. The means of these creatures are to destroy. It's destruction. It's to show the wrath that Jesus said would come. It's that God had promised would come that it is going to come on this world and those that have rejected that Jesus is the Son of God. Their means of destruction, uh, uh, the, the, the never dying soul is never destroyed. I want you to understand that. We always say, uh, you know, your soul gets saved and goes to heaven and we say, we say, you know, we don't think about the lost soul. Everybody that you pass on the road has a never dying soul. The question is, where is that never dying soul going to spend eternity? And we have to understand that. And this means of this destruction is to kill bodies. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse, start with verse 8, in flaming fire, this is, this is describing this time, uh, at the end of the time, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Why did Jesus come? To seek and to save the lost, right? You reject Jesus. You turn your back on Jesus. You say, I'm going to follow the world. This is going to happen. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. That's talking about the lake of fire. It's fire. And this, these horses, we see the fire and we see these, these creatures, demonic creatures that are going to be causing people to die that will send them to a holding place called hell and eventually after the great white throne be cast into the lake of fire. Their, their never dying soul will live forever knowing that they will be destroyed and away from God. But there's a means to be saved from this lake of fire. There's a means of salvation that 
We don't, tell, you know, once, a lot of times we get saved and we say, hey, I'm getting in, I don't got to worry about the rest. I believe that's, that's not very good of us. I don't believe that's what God wants us to do, he, especially when he says we are to manifest Jesus. Jesus came to seek and to save. We need to be seeking and saving those that are lost. And we be sharing the gospel every chance we get. John 3, 16, we all quote it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But in verse 17 it says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. I asked you a while ago, how many chances has he given you? How many times has God stopped you in your tracks to get your attention? My son died for you. Why reject him? He did all the work. He allowed the Roman soldiers to beat his back, lay it open, pull the meat out. He laid his life down, was nailed to a cross. We're going to celebrate the Lord's table here in a minute. He shed his blood that was we saw in point one, that he's going to blot out our sins with that cleansing that only Jesus' blood can do. There is a means, and that is Jesus. And it says that he didn't come to condemn the world. No, he come that he might save the world. It's us that reject him, but he gives us the opportunity. I believe we need to step up and understand this appointed means. Ephesians 2, 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your, of your doing, it's the gift of God. We talked to that young lady last week, Delisha. Y'all pray for Delisha. She believes everybody's going to heaven. There's a lot of people in the world that believe everybody's going to heaven. That's another one of them devil's lies. But the very thing we're talking about today is the truth. Not everybody's going to heaven. We've, just, we've read several verses today that says we're not all going to heaven. Praise the Lord by your testimony. And I know many of you, you've told me that you're saved. Hallelujah, you're going to be with me in heaven when all this is taking place. What about those outside? What about those outside? Are we doing our part? Are we actually trying to reach those? Well, see, there leads us to our fourth, fourth and final point. There is an appointed outcome. I wish Felicia or uh, uh, Delicia was right. I wished everybody was going to heaven. I really do. It make it so easy. And that's what Satan wants to tell us, and that's how we want to leave. But here's the thing. Start with verse 20 of our text. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of their works of their hands, nor give up the worship, worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. For they did, uh, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thieves, thefts. Even though they will witness all this death, Half of the world's population dead in three and a half years. When this is all said and done, they're going to be so calloused and their hearts are going to be so hardened. I believe that this sixth trumpet is to take out the population and it's obviously to rid the world. And I, I, I don't know if you've thought about this and we'll see it a little bit later. Not everybody's going to die on the world, on the earth. There will be people left at the end of the tribulation that will go into the millennial reign. Think about that for a minute. Some of these people that have witnessed this will live through a portion of the millennial reign. I don't believe they're going to have longevity like we will. We will rule and reign for a thousand years with the Lord if we have our glorified bodies. But those that just have their regular bodies that don't end up dying, they still have a chance to hear salvation. But I believe that the door is being closed on second chances when these creatures come out. We've tried to, I've tried to, I've, I've, I've read and I've studied and I believe that, you know, the, the book of Revelation is about the Jews 
and God getting their attention and them saying that Jesus was the Messiah. But the Gentiles were being drawn into this wrath. And I believe it's very important that we understand that there is an outcome. The point out once and forever that Jesus is the Son of God. And we need to do our part to make sure that we reach these people before these demons kill them and they have no chance, no second chance. There's an outcome for rejection. We've talked about that. People want to keep about themselves and they don't want to do what God has called them to do. In John 12, verse 48, it says, The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. You don't want to stand before this judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. The very words that we choose to not read, the very words that we choose not to share will be the very words that that person will stand before an almighty God in the form of Jesus Christ, the great judge at the great white throne of judgment. We're going to read about it later. And here's where you come into the picture, though. I believe that God has the greatest tech, technical situation that anybody's ever wanted, especially after the way I was ready to throw that computer out the window this morning. But here's the thing. I believe that if you have the opportunity to share the gospel, that individual is going to see you sharing the gospel with them. They will be able to recall, just as we have the Holy Spirit tells us the words that we are to say, the Holy Spirit's going to let them remember the day that Miss Kathy sat there and said, you know, Jesus loves you. Let me share a little bit of scripture with you. Let me pray with you. It's going to be right there in front of them. There is an outcome to everything that you do. You may not see somebody except the Lord that day. You may not see anybody. Uh, you know, I, I pray all the time somebody gets saved. I've been praying for Raul for eight years. I've been praying for many. I still pray for Vinny. I don't know about you. I still pray for James and Karen. I still pray for people who have darkened our doors and come in here asking for help. And we've tried to help them with the word and the truth. Can't give up on them. There's an outcome. We don't want to see them reject. But here's the thing. There's an outcome for those that do surrender. Those that surrender today is what we have to look forward to. And in Luke 9, starting with verse 23, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, that's Jesus. Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life would lose it. But whosoever or whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For, that does it, for what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? We're so caught up in today. We're so caught up in the things of this world. We're so caught up in the things, especially me. How does it benefit me? You know, if we share the gospel and we see somebody get saved, hallelujah, it will affect you. They're in a happier time in the, on this planet. You lead somebody to the Lord, it's a, it's a grand time. You get goosebumps. I know I do. And I know that maybe, just maybe, the words I spoke, even though somebody doesn't pray to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, maybe somebody else will come along and cry over that individual and water the seed that was planted. And then there will be somebody else will come by maybe five, ten years later and they'll get saved. I got one of the greatest compliments I think I've ever had last night. And I was getting ready for bed, and I just I, I, I usually jump over to Facebook, just see what kind of craziness is going on with family and friends. And a guy that I worked with in Florida, now we're talking a long time ago, this event, and I, remember, I think I know the event that he was talking about. And, and, and he was, he's, there was a little poster that says, name somebody that impacted your life and faith. I believe that's the way it was said. 
And he used my name. He didn't just do the name like a lot of people did. He said, it's amazing the impact of watching someone live out their faith. And that was the, because the Lord knows I was needing a little uh, lift last night. Because I was thinking about this message and how devil's not going to want it. And I needed something to just push me a little bit. And he used an old friend. And I'll tell you what he did for me one day. They was all going on. I had, a, I had a toolbox and I had tracks under it. I had a picture of the cross and Jesus. And I could, I mean, I could stand on my toolbox and preach all day long. And as a manager, I got away with it. But there was a group that, that kind of cornered me one day. And he said, y'all back off. He believes that. Maybe you ought to also. There's an outcome to what you do for the Lord. There's an outcome that you may not see this side of heaven. There's an outcome for those that surrender and give everything of themselves for the cause of Christ. There's challenges in this world, and they're getting to be more and more. But there's an outcome for redemption also, and that's heaven. Ephesians chapter 1, verses, starting with verse 7. In Him He... We have redemption. I can't read. My eyes are all watered up. In him we have redemption through his blood for forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. God's riches at Christ's expense, right? Which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight and making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. Let me just add my word there. Forever. You accept it. There's, there's an outcome for being redeemed. To unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Are you aware of the pointed outcome? You have to make a choice. We read in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. But hallelujah, there's a comma. But the gift of God is eternal life. And all you have to do is choose to receive that free gift of salvation. You know, it doesn't say you have to do this, that, or the other. Then you can be saved. It says accept a free gift that Jesus made there on the cross of Calvary. Ask Him to forgive you of your sins and give you the strength and the courage. And what He does, He gives you His Word. He gives you His Holy Spirit because you made a choice to take the gift and open it. I love that Jesus loved me that much. That God loved me that much. That He not only gave Jesus, but He now indwells me. For what? So that I can tell others about Him. So I asked you earlier, how many chances has God given? If you're saved, praise the Lord, and you've accepted that gift, how many chances have you helped somebody else get? So my conclusion is, how many chances have you been given? One day you will stand and answer for your decision. You will stand before judge. You will stand before Jesus. That's all of us. I don't want to see anybody in here go to the great white throne because then you'll stand by yourself and answer for your sins based on the law, the words of God, the truth that we've already proved in our message today. Some of us will stand at the Bema seat though. We'll not be judged for our sins. Hallelujah. Jesus forgave us of our sins. But we will be judged on how we use this weapon that he's given us with the truth. We will be judged on how we shared the name of Jesus in our lives and it's this great audition we call life. We will be judged for the ones that we lead to Jesus. You can believe me or not. It's in the book. It's in the Bible. It's been promised. He gave us warning and he gives us chances every day to share his love, His truth. 
How are we doing that? As a church, we're having a big tent revival. Amen? We're going to share the gospel. How do we do that? We pray. We pray people in. But what about today? Did you invite anybody to church this week? I don't need to know the answer to that. God does. Did you share the gospel of Jesus to anybody? I have this week, but I'm ashamed at how little I did. I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching at me. The times are short. I believe the stage is set for the events that we've been reading about in Revelation. What are we doing to keep people out of hell? What are we doing to keep people from having to witness the tribulation period? What are we doing about the jewels in our crowns? Amen. Or even receiving a crown. We get there, we get the crown of life. We all get that one. Share the gospel. Be a soul winner. There's a lot more to come. Philippians 2, verse, starting with verse 9, says this, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The choice is yours. You can do it here today or you can stand before the great white throne and you will do it there when he proves to you the truth of his word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your many chances that you give us. I pray that we would be diligent about the things that you've laid before us to do. We would not do it in a fleshly strength, which I sometimes catch myself doing. But Lord, let me be yielded to your perfect will, your means, your weapons. And I pray that we would move forward as individuals and as a body of believers, as a church, to share the glorious and wonderful news of Jesus. Jesus saves. I pray that you'd touch our hearts. Many of us have the Holy Spirit. You live within us. You indwell us. You convict us. Today, I want you to break our hearts for the lost. Today, I want you to allow us to sense the urgency I thank you for the chances you've given me. But I pray, Lord, that we would not be caught up in what we have done, but what we are doing. Let us move forward with strength and courage and all the things that your word gives us. Let us not be weary in well-doing. Let us not be afraid of Satan. But let us be patient and watching for him when he brings his darkness and his lies that we will speak up and have the truth of your, your precious word and our testimony where you live within us that we can shine a bright light that can't be hidden that will make the darkness run Lord touch us use us please we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing I Surrender All. I pray that you would sing along. Uh, we'll sing a verse. We'll see how the Lord moves. You can deal with God right where you're at. But I pray that you'll not listen. Hey, listen, I, this is not the time to start talking about what I've said. This is not the time to start talking about what's going to happen at lunchtime. This is the time to pray. You may not have anything for today, but be patient with those around you. You don't know what God's doing in somebody else's life today. So let's stand, close our eyes, and listen to the words. If God moves your heart, this altar's open. I'll be up here. I have a mask if you want me to wear a mask. But don't leave here not making the choice that God wants you to make today. Amen? Let's sing. Yeah.
Y'all may be seated. Um, I pray that everybody has their 